Hey everyone, it's Eric Thor here to bring you 10 books you should read in April. Okay, so I found that reading is a really good way for me to keep my mind fresh and so I brought up reading. But unlike other booktubers out there, I can't really show you the books. The books are not here in physical form. Where are they, you might ask? On your bookshelf? Your really meager and like empty and like sad bookshelf? No, 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 I, I don't have that. I'm one of those like stupid hipsters with an e-reader. So yeah, uh, here it is, the 10 books that I read in, uh, read in uh, February. Yeah, sorry about that. Anyways, in this uh, video, I'm going to show you nine books that I really enjoyed and one book that was so absolutely horrid that I'd like to forget I ever even opened it. And I hope you can stay tuned for some really interesting books on the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator, on uh, the Jungian Cognitive Functions, and on different personality types, as well as some practical psychology and nonfiction. So, first off, let's start with 4,000 Weeks. 4,000 Weeks was written by Oliver Berkman, and it's a kind of a case study of a productivity guru. So, Oliver Berkman, he was one of those people that used to praise, you know, the zero inbox strategy, so that you never ever have an unread email in your inbox ever again, you know. Like, he praised, you know, different time management strategies to maintain peak performance at all times. However, he ran into a problem, and that was that the more productive he was, the more standards went up. And so, he found himself stuck in a loop of ever-increasing productivity. He had to send more and more emails every single week to make up uh, for his rules. He had to plan in more and more meetings. He had to uh, complete more and more tasks. No matter how effective he got, he never got to that dawn, you know, that day where he could rest and relax. So he started thinking about it. How is it that I never get time for rest? Why is it that no matter how much I work or how much I do, that I never get the chance for a vacation, okay? So this is actually a real eye-opener and it made me really aware of my time, you know, and it made me start thinking about how I manage my time at work because it's so easy to get caught in the trap of doing more and more and stressing more and more at work, but this made me realize how priceless every hour of the day is and how important it is to live every day with intention and with energy and to try to uh, change your lifestyle so that you can focus on doing things that are actually important to you. We praise being effective, but shouldn't we praise the right kind of effectiveness? So being effective in doing things that you love and enjoy, shouldn't we talk about how we can uh, tune our attention towards things that matter and shouldn't we talk about how to enjoy the tasks that we engage in and how to make sure that we stay present in what we do. These are some of the things you can learn from 4000 Weeks and it's probably one of the best books that I read this month. Now, if you enjoy book reviews, don't forget to leave a like and to subscribe and to leave a comment down below and I'll let you know if I'll make the 10 books you should read in May. Moving forward, book number two is Cognitive Personality Theory by Harry Merle, our very own Harry Merle. So Harry, he wrote this second edition of his book and I've actually already made a video about it so you can hear more about it and my interview with him uh, in um, a video and I'll show you at the end of this uh, video where you can find it. Third, I, a book I really enjoyed was Siddhartha by Hermann Hesse. So I wish actually that I had read this book sooner because it's right up my ally. So, <laughs> Ali, <laughs> so I am absolutely nuts for those books like The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho, uh, Life of Pi, and those kind of similar epic journey books. So Into the Wild, you know, all those kind of things. Just bring it to me, the seeker that goes on a quest to find out the truth and meaning of the world, you know. This is what I live for, and reading that book, I was in awe the whole way through. <laughs> Siddhartha by Hermann Hess studies a man who is born into wealth and riches and authority and uh, praise. He is a person believed to become truly great, but he decides to be selfish and to make a choice for himself, and that choice is to abstain from everything. He decides to 
in a way, uh, go on a journey to deprive himself from everything, all the material welfare of the world and all the luxury, and to instead find himself detaching from the physical world. And so, in many ways, it's a quest to find out what the self is. No matter how much he struggles, and no matter how much he tries to deprive himself of food and material wealth and welfare, he finds himself and the ego continually resurfacing. And no matter how much he tries to kill the ego and to reach the higher state of being or a higher spiritual existence, he keeps coming back to the physical world. So this is his journey and it kind of praises a similar approach to life and a similar existential uh, truth to the truth that I tend to praise and that is instead of trying to search for enlightenment in pulling yourself away from things, try instead to pursue enlightenment by doing whatever it is that you're doing but with intention and with motivation, with clarity and awareness. That means do whatever it is you're doing right now but pay complete attention to your thoughts and feelings and everything that's happening. Siddhartha ultimately goes on quite a journey and loses himself many times I think throughout this journey but hey I think you have to get lost to find your way right? The third book that I read this uh, last month was Flow by Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi and I can never pronounce that name um, and it's about the flow state and it's a western take on the flow state so in many ways it's a focus on the psychology of the optimal experience what Mihaly does is he studies some of the most successful people in the world chess players athletes and others who find their who find their flow and uh, Mihaly he posts a definition of flow and that is that to enter into a flow state you need two things you need to be really good at something and you need to be really challenged doing something that you're really good at so the more challenging something is and the more talented you are at something the greater the flow you can acquire when you do it so confidence seems to be a key for Mihaly's definition of the flow state now what I'd argue is that Mihaly kind of messes the mark with the book. It's a good book and it's a good introduction to the flow state but it's not a complete way of looking at it. What I feel he misses is that flow is not about productivity or just sheer talent. Flow is not necessarily found in uh, being good at your work. You're not in flow when you're like stressing away on deadlines and uh, producing a lot or like being super busy all the time, you know, that's not the flow state. Flow is a much more rich and free state and it is a state of not just confidence but also comfort. So in flow you feel attention, you feel immersion, and you feel motivation and you feel energy. You feel certainly confidence and confidence is certainly a key to it as is appropriate challenge. But it's not the only thing you need in order to stay engaged and to stay present. Sometimes I think uh, he's too caught up in the Western wheel of, you know, uh, needing to constantly keep yourself busy. And sometimes I feel like he got a bit lost, especially in the end chapters where he discusses, you know, what is the point of life and what is it that is the meaning of life. Ultimately, Mihaly says there is no meaning. We just create one on our own and <laughs> convince ourselves that that's it. But I don't think that's it. I think meaning was always there there was always something that we found really meaningful there was always something inside of us that we were burning to find or to create or to uh, realize within ourselves but we don't necessarily know what it is so we don't create meaning we find it what's really good about Mihaly is he touches on and he learns a lot and draws a lot of lessons from Carl Jung uh, in fact, this idea of the flow state is very much connected to Jung's concept of psychic energy and the tension of opposites. Mihaly actually does a really interesting job and actually wrote a really interesting book and I actually enjoyed reading it. I just feel like it could have gone further. The fourth book I read in, in March uh, was Eat, Pray, Love. And Eat, Pray, Love is so much fun. Eat, Pray, Love is written by Elizabeth Gilbert, who is an amazing author. And it uh, details, uh, in a very honest way, an expose on her 
divorce, her struggles in love, and her travels to Italy, to India and Indonesia. She meets a medicine man and she studies at an ashram, <laughs> ashram and uh, she uh, eats a lot of pizza. <laughs> and uh, she is just very funny in how she talks about meditation, how she talks about finding yourself, and in how she talks about love and relationships and all today, you know, like recognizable things. She also like gives a very human like perspective and it's uh, really nice to see somebody talk that is just really, really honest in her writing. After this, um, I read a comprehensive ENFP survival guide by Heidi Preeb. And uh, this is a book uh, focused on the ENFP experiences and the ENFP thought processes and how the ENFP's mind works. And what I like about Heidi is she's really funny. <laughs> she has a really nice and really engaging way of writing her books. And uh, she does a really good uh, job of talking about and being also really honest and really vulnerable in her personal examples, her personal experiences being an ENFP. And uh, yeah, like she kind of says, life as an ENFP is no walk in the park. Certainly it doesn't seem to be. So I'm really glad that she wrote this book and I can definitely recommend it if you're an ENFP or if you know an ENFP and want to know more about them. Six is Was That Really Me by Naomi L. Quenk. And uh, Naomi, she wrote a book on the inferior function and how it can take us over the grip of the inferior function. So this is actually a book that is relatively unknown in the community, I feel like, especially today. But it's a book that can be really interesting to read if you're curious about how the inferior function might manifest. What Naomi does is she gives examples from different people, showing real examples of different people she interviewed and talked to and how they experience the inferior function in their personal lives. It has some really startling information on work st uh, related stress and long term stress and how that might infect or affect a person. So she outlines how the inferior function is connected to stress. And that's an idea or hypothesis that I very much agree with. And she gives some really interesting examples on it. What I do feel with her book, however, is that she does miss the mark on some levels. Um, her book is a great starter, but what I do see is, and what I feel like should be talked about more, is that every type might even enjoy the inferior function to a certain degree. I find, and my theory is that the inferior function is actually quite enjoyable as long as it is experienced in a stress-free and tension-free manner. And I would also say that the inferior function is manageable and even fun if it fits with and aligns with the interests of the dominant function. And there will be times when the dominant function and your dominant values, whatever they might be, intersect with the needs and values of your inferior function. And then you're gonna find that in these times you will have a pretty smooth free and uh, flowful life. Uh, and the more you can learn to create bridges between these two functions and the more connections you can build between them, the more easy you'll find it is to manage the energy and the values and the emotions of both of these functions in a positive and constructive manner. So what I feel the book misses is how we can manage and improve at this function. And besides that, it's a really good and self-aware depiction of what it can look like in the beginning stages when we're starting to wrestle with and understand this function. A less interesting book that I read uh, is on um, the way of Qigong, Art and Science of Chinese Energy Healing by Kenneth Cohen. I started reading this book because I'm fascinated with uh, Taoism and with uh, Chinese religion and spirituality and philosophy and because Qigong uh, is one of the ways alongside acupuncture and uh, other forms of Chinese traditional medicine. And Qigong is a really interesting approach and way to um, approach something that I think uh, Jungians and Myers-Briggs nerds are gonna find very familiar. You could say that Qigong is the physical manifestation of the same concepts and actions and activities that Carl Jung discusses for the mind. So 
Carl Jung was deeply influenced by the practices of the Tao, the hexagrams and the yin-yang concept and the dance of opposites and Qigong is very much the dance of opposites. To simplify it, you could say that Qigong is kind of a motion where you uh, first in one way embody both the qualities of yin and yang. So for example, you could say that you make a motion with uh, uh, your hands pulling them towards the sky and then pulling your hands down um, towards the earth. And so you're bridging the energy of intuition and the sensory. And it's the physical manifestation of what happens in your mind. So Qigong is actually a way to engage physically and to understand physically how the brain uh, might relate to and connect to these things. So, you know, if this sounds really spiritual and weird for you, probably it is. I'll be honest with that. Uh, however, Kenneth does bring some pretty good evidence that Qigong is a really useful and positively healthy way to improve well-being for people. He has shown that, uh, he shows on several studies that show that Qigong can be combined with uh, modern medicine to improve the effectiveness of healing and to help treat all manners of is uh, issues and problems and that Qigong can actually in many ways improve your health. Now it's not surprising that it can. While reading this book I found myself practicing many of its activities and I found it was a way to make myself very much mindful of my body and the physical world and to make myself more comfortable in my own body and my skin. As an intuitive dominant that can be something very necessary. What I'm finding as well is that uh, while I was engaged in these <laughs> practices of Qigong as a highly sensitive person, uh, something I noticed was that this was very, very evocative for me. These kind of exercises and dances and movements and different kinds of techniques, they were very much, uh, like they made me feel shivers all throughout my body and it really felt like a release. And combining and connecting, you know, how uh, Jung saw it and how Qigong works, that's, I think, a really interesting thought process, a really nice thing to dig into. Book number nine is Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Now, Thinking and Fast and Slow is a book uh, that talks about two systems of the brain. One is automatic. It works through the gut. It's more intuitive, but not necessarily intuition, in the sense that it works effortlessly without thought in a minute of milliseconds. So what he found is this system is complemented by a more mechanical and focused and attention demanding process. So system one and system two. So system one and system two describe how we make decisions and how we process things and what he shows consistently is that our gut feeling is not as smart as we'd like it to be and as we think it is. While we are prone to say that, oh, I'm able to somehow predict and figure things out, he shows that actually uh, you probably weren't. And so this book goes over a wide range of fallacies and biases and problems when you start trying to measure the effectiveness of the gut feeling. Now, thinking fast and slow is actually not right on the mark here because there are actually values to the gut and to making decisions in the gut and the gut can actually be very very smart and he actually shows that himself he will give examples and show how he worked with people on the other side of the debate and how they humbled him and kind of showed him that there can also be a use for this more automatic and more intuitive system but his lessons and his exercises are healthy for anyone to engage with and I think the message, the key takeaway from this book is pretty clear. And that is that we should be uh, trying to think more consciously about what we do. If you have a gut feeling about something, think, why am I having this gut feeling about something? What are my reasons impossible to be feeling this way? And where does this come from? And Am I prone to any of these biases? Am I really as objective as I think I am? Now, those were the nine books I really enjoyed. Now let's talk about a book I enjoyed less, and that is 
Wu Wei, Effortless Living by Jason Gregory. And this is the most laughable book and take on Taoism that I've ever encountered. So the first thing that uh, Jason does is he talks about how nobody has understood Taoism and how it's been so misunderstood and only he has shown and found out how it really works. You know, there, there you know, you're already off for a good start there. Um, then he talks about how he spent years trying to write this book and only with the support of his loving wife was he able to finish this. And then, uh, you know, okay, okay, uh, that's interesting. Uh, now, getting on to the book, um, the book is kind of a rant. Uh, it's a rant against several people who he feels have misunderstood everything. And it's a rant and the disagreement with several things like Confucius and with other different masters. And it's, um, in many ways, it's <laughs> focused on the world has come to be dominated by masculinity and masculinity is the cause of everything wrong with the world. And okay, while well you can make a legitimate criticism of masculinity and social context and uh, talk about problems of masculinity, um, the argument here is that um, the, masculine, the masculine should not be in control of the world, the feminine should be in control of the world. He gives an example to chocolate milk and says, ideally you want your glass to be full of milk or feminine energy. And then you want to add a small tablespoon of chocolate powder. And that's the masculine energy. And so he argues for a world that is more dominated by feminine values. And he talks about the problem of masculine values. He says that, for example, Apparently, masculine energy is the reason why we have global warming in the world. And because there is so much masculine energy and because masculine energy is warm, well, that's why we have global warming. There are so many men and the men are so masculine that they are warming up the planet with their masculinity. And, uh, so like this is where I started really fading off. And uh, yeah, I kept on reading it like uh, uh, because I don't really like to quit on books. Uh, but it just went downhill from there. So this book you should definitely not read in April, uh, but the rest I can warmly recommend. Thank you so much for enjoying these book reviews and I hope to see you all in the next video.